Now I have the pleasure of introducing our first educational presentation this morning. Dr. Pamela Gonzalez will be addressing youth opioid addiction, a part of your practice, so what should you know? Dr. Gonzalez is an assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Minnesota and an active member in the AAP's efforts to address adolescent substance use. Please welcome Dr. Pamela Gonzalez. Hi, I just have to do a sound check. Can everybody hear me? I'm usually the one most likely to have sound problems, so we're doing good. Um, I really, wow, I can't believe I'm up here. Um, but I'm really grateful, and I'm grateful on behalf of the children who I serve to be able to have the, this opportunity to talk about something that really is um, a threat uh, to child health and child well-being. Um, specifically, what I'm going to be talking about is the threat of heroin, but it's really the threat of substance use in general. Um, part of why we're in the crisis that we're in, there are specifics about it, but part of it really is, is vilifying um, people who have substance use problems, not talking about it, not taking care of the generations before them who beget children who have problems. So we really need to be able to take this issue out into the open. Um, and pediatrics is poised um, to approach things in a preventive um, and uh, child-focused, developmentally appropriate way. So thank you for the opportunity to speak this morning. So I want to talk about Andy. Um, as pediatricians, most of us experience loss of patients, um, myself included. Um, in speaking with pediatricians over the past couple of days, it's become more obvious to me that I'm not alone in this experience with heroin addiction. Um, I've never before cried over a patient death before. Um, this one hit me differently. Um, Andy is an 18-year-old um, who I met on an inpatient unit who died in September. Um, unfortunately, he's, his story is kind of typical in terms of substance use. Um, he started using very young, um, started with um, alcohol, tobacco, and cannabis prior to the age of 14. He then was exposed to prescription opioids. That's how he started using opioids at the age of 15 and moved on to heroin at 16. And he was injecting for about a year and a half um, prior to the time that I had seen him. He had undergone multiple overdoses. Um, and after uh, leaving the hospital twice, um, he finally ended up uh, overdosing and being found um, by the parents. More than once, um, some of those overdose attempts were on purpose um, because he felt completely hopeless um, about the situation that he had ended up in because of his illness and also because of the, the guilt and the burden um, on his family. And so one of the other things I just wanted to point out is this is one of the few times that anyone has had um, the courage, and I'm proud of them, for indicating that he died of a heroin overdose. Usually all we see is 18-year-old dies, and we go, why did an 18-year-old die? So I'm really proud of this family in the middle of their pain that they brought this out and to, to highlight this problem that we have. It begins with one pill. So we've been busy over the past about year and a half patting ourselves on the back for what great strides we've made with nothing wrong with prescription monitoring databases, but it hasn't answered a lot of problems. It has reduced some of the prescribing in the adult populations. I use those monitoring databases every day myself for different reasons. They have their utility. But it hasn't come down enough to actually make a dent in kids' initial use of these drugs. They don't need enough of the medication to maintain their use. They just need enough to get exposed for their brain to figure out that that's the drug that their brain likes, and then they're off. In the 60s, which is when heroin um, had its first big peak, most people started opioid use through heroin. That was the 60s. Now we can be proud of ourselves, American medicine, because that same proportion gets introduced to opioid use through prescription opioids. Then they move on to heroin. So somewhere about half a million of our youth, 12 to 17, uh, reported past month use of prescription opioids for a non-medical reason. So they use somebody else's prescription, they use their own leftovers, they used it for some non-prescribed purpose. 16,000 12 to 17 year olds endorsed past month use. 16,000 of our children using heroin. And this has been going on actually for the past couple of years, this, this number. Um, we've had a triple, tripling of the heroin overdose rates 
between 2010 and 2014. And the growingest population of new initiates is in the emerging adult population, so 18 to 24, which is the bulk of the people I see in treatment. Um, I'm gonna point out, remind us that this is actually among the age group, the age range that we take care of as pediatricians. Um, the other is to highlight, I want everybody to end up as nervous and as motivated to do something about this as I am and as I do every day. These are children. These are all our children. These are our patients. And actually, Dr. Dreyer, I wanted to point out that I really appreciate your pronoun choices yesterday. We and our. Every time you talk about children, I notice that you always said we. They're all ours. They're all mine. They're all my responsibility. And I also feel like every time another physician makes a choice with prescribing oxycodone in a way that I don't think is so great, I say we because I can no longer sit here and say, well, I'm not prescribing it or it's not my problem, it's not me doing it. We, can, we fall short of our responsibility sometimes by what we do and we fall short by not taking responsibility and speaking out about what some, somebody else or some other discipline is doing and that's where we come in and I'll get to that in a second. So the other thing I wanna point out that we're so great at as pediatricians, a toddler died, one toddler, of liquid nicotine and we appropriately rallied in response to that and got changes made in terms of how those containers are secured. 16,000 children are using heroin and many of them are dying between 18 and 24. Andy was a smooth-skinned, baby-faced boy. That was a child who died. And I heard stories yesterday, at least 12 people telling me of 12 children who died in their practices when they came up to talk to me after my um, presentation yesterday. So this is a crisis and we need to dial up the game and we as pediatricians need to use our voices to do something about it and not leave it in the hands of just adults and adult medicine. There is plenty of heroin when the pills run out. So as I said, we don't need enough of a supply to maintain somebody's addiction. We just need enough to get them started. So partly it's when a supplies run, up, run out in the markets that they're in. The other is it's just quite frankly cheaper. And so um, like it or not, people who traffic and deal in heroin are very good business people. They have gotten their price point and their product purity to a place that's very competitive with pills. And sometimes they also use it in concert with that. That's part of how they get people to, oh, just take a pill. It's a, you know what's in it. It's perfectly safe. It's not a problem. Or if they or their friends encourage them to use heroin, it's just snort it. If you just snort it, you'll be okay. That's the kind of message that's out there. But that's also the market that's out there. So we shouldn't be surprised how many kids and young adults end up converting to using heroin when they just don't have the money and they don't have the supply anymore. And heroin's not going anywhere real soon. Um, the, in the past five years, when you look at the DEA seizures of heroin, it continues to go up and up and up. There's plenty of a supply coming in and it's plenty cheap. The young are over, oops, sorry. <laughs> go back. The young are overrepresented among the dead. Um, so you'll notice, where's my, ah, all right. There should be a circle. If you look at the 18 to 24 mark, that's a middle green line there. Um, number one, again, it's dial up the gain and look at how we're viewing the epidemiology. All of those graphs, whether it's 25 to 44, 18 to 24 is going up. But when you look at age adjustment, the number of initiates, the proportion of people using in that age group, the people most at risk of initiating heroin use and dying from it is the emerging adult population, our patients. Brains don't differentiate between licit and illicit drugs, nor licit or illicit intentions when we give them, um, uh, prescribe them, or, or how it's taken. This becomes important when sometimes research talks about when uh, people move on from the legal drugs to using stuff that's harder or harsher. The brain doesn't differentiate between legality or whether we decide to make it controlled or not controlled. It's pretty well accepted that Nicotine is one of the, the substances with the most addictive properties. We don't schedule it, right? So the brain can't tell the difference between what label it or what our intention was when we gave it. Case in point, 
um, people are probably familiar, or many people are probably familiar with this recent study, finally we're starting to look at it, is legitimate prescribing, or what's presumed to be legitimate prescribing, just the young brain being exposed to opioids in the first place. For the longest time, and it was part of my training, that if I gave it to you and my intent was, was appropriate and you took it what I deemed appropriately, there's no risk to you whatsoever. That's not true. I actually had, had somebody say to me once, um, I won't say, I won't give much detail, but just to say, I'm not gonna turn a kid into a junkie by putting him on a fentanyl drip. First of all, I didn't really like the use of the word junkie, but how do you know that? How do you know? We don't, we don't know. The answer is we don't know. Well, now we're getting some inklings, right? That even this legitimate prescribing, it doesn't matter what you intended, it's the exposure that matters. Now, is every single kid at risk? No, there's enhanced risk, or a third higher risk of non-medical use by, by emerging adult. That doesn't mean it waits that long. It means that's when they measured it. A lot of them may have done it a year or two later. The other is there's a higher risk of non-medical use for the intention of getting, of getting high or of stress relief or whatever like CNS desired response that the kid is looking for. So there are certain kids who are, are yes at more risk, but I don't know about you, I can't tell by looking at them. Unless they come in intoxicated and I'm lucky enough for that or they have needle marks or whatever, I don't know which kid looking at them. I know which kids, some kids are sitting ducks. That's why I'm really glad we've been talking about poverty adverse childhood experiences, including having a parent who may also be using substances, a kid who has depression, a kid who is that disruptive kid when they were five. There are a lot of kids who are set up to be at risk for using substances and for having their brains respond to them in the first place. But still, even with that, I can't just look at a kid walking in. It means I have to screen them. It means we have to use our words and generate the conversation with parents and before they're 16, before they're 15, um, and we have to stop the benignification of marijuana. I have to forgive me. I make up my own words. Thank you. And um, this is apart from, yes, do people need to go to jail for having marijuana? No. Should we be looking at decriminalization? Yes. But I'll use my own state, and I love Minnesota. I love Minnesota. I'm embarrassed by our medical cannabis program. What on earth are we doing? And part of what is being... Um, relayed to kids through such programs and through the pro pot propaganda without a response from us greater and stronger at the state and community level than it is, then those families and those kids get their information from somewhere else. High Times, coloradopotguide.com. There's a series of books called Stinky Steve. Has anybody seen those? There's about 12 of them. They're targeted at, at least I can tell, six to eight year olds that talk about basically normalize and benignify parental use, medical cannabis, daddy's dabs, which is a highly concentrated way of getting THC into the body. And so if that's what they're up against, it really does. It makes parents, it makes a lot of us, because I've had a lot of conversation and seen a lot of change over the past year in pediatricians I've interacted with, because we weren't really clear in our messages, in our thinking. Well, I smoked once 30 years ago, it ain't like 30 years ago. It's nowhere near like 30 years ago. And if you're 14, it's different than if you're deciding to do it when you're 40. We're an important part of the message about unbenignifying marijuana. And an extra reason why? The relationship to other substance use. So fire trucks don't cause fires, but when you see a fire truck, you get curious. It's a marker that something might be going on. When the fire alarm goes off, is it always a fire? No, but the firefighters go. So for us as pediatricians, if I have a 14-year-old who's smoking marijuana, that's a marker to me. That's a fire alarm of not only are you developing a problem with cannabis itself, but are you currently or are you going to in the future recreate with Percocet and then move on to heroin? They're three times more likely if they have a cannabis use problem to either have or go on to develop a heroin use problem. Stop benignifying marijuana. Um, another high risk group is kids who already have depression, trauma, anxiety. They're far more likely to come in with some of the musculoskeletal complaints, and those very same kids are more likely to be prescribed an opioid. So the very group among adults who we know are higher risk and we really need to be careful and maybe avoid giving opioids to, the same is turning out to be the case for children and adolescents. So we're starting to fall into the same trap. Silence is deadly. 
What's going to solve this problem? Not being silent, not being quiet about it, not not asking because we, so a lot of, I hear a lot of people still saying, well, there aren't enough resources. I don't know where to send them to. What am I going to do? There's a lot of illnesses that we look for, that we get the diagnosis for, and the, the outcome may be supportive or maybe it's just a difficult conversation with a family. But just because at this point resources are not the what we want them to be does not mean not to look. Looking and figuring out what the problem is helps us argue for resources. I can tell you some of the money that's um, coming from the, the federal level to treat um, uh, addiction in states related to opioids, Minnesota can't get it because we don't have enough of a problem. If every state can't get it to help <laughs> with their treatment resources and prevention resources, then that's not enough money that's earmarked. But we can't argue for it if we aren't asking enough and we aren't screening enough to figure out what's the scope of the problem in our community, in our office, in our state. So now what? Um, it's only going to be another like, brief period of time, um, but highway to heroin, we're going to be talking a little bit more about some of these issues at 5 o'clock today. It's going to be in the uh, Moscone cell. The other is I can't stress enough screening, screening for mental health, not at the exclusion of substance use. I notice that in a lot of states, a lot of uh, community initiatives, a lot of um, health practice initiatives are to do mental health and somehow they leave off substance use. Or once substance use happens, they get sent off siloed into other parts of care, um, into unvetted treatment um, programs. They lose touch with their medical home. They lose touch or never get the psychiatric services that they need. And so we're really doing a disservice to them by not fighting to keep both the prevention and the ongoing treatment needs when they get, once they get this far as part of overall medical care and care in the community. The other thing is when, it, when they sneak through, when our primary prevention efforts don't work, when our secondary prevention efforts don't work, we are going to have kids who need treatment. And some of those kids can do better on some form of medication than not. Buprenorphine, which is the medication that's in Suboxone, is one of those. Here's a reality check. Of the three medications that are available, methadone, injectable naltrexone, and buprenorphine, buprenorphine is essentially unavailable. Fewer than 50% of U.S. counties have at least one wavered prescriber of buprenorphine. Many of them, their practices are full or they're just not using their waiver, so they're not actually seeing patients. Fewer still are going to see anybody below 18, and it is FDA approved for 16 and older, and there are a few of us in um, specialty practice who will go younger as needed. We need more people to become wavered. If anything, it's more critical because it's a smaller number of people who need it. That means the, the, the spread, you know, the, uh, the catchment of providers who are actually able to provide it, so wherever a kid is that they're going to be able to get the medication, sure. they're going to be able to get it. And fortunately now, you can get, um, AAP members can get free training. So if you go to aap.org backslash MAT, you can get signed up um, for free training. The only other thing I'll throw in there, because I'll answer questions whenever anybody sees me about it, is don't get listed in the treatment locator. I'm not listed in the treatment locator either. Locator either. It just get the training done, and then you'll be able to be available for that kid. It may just be one that you need to be able to provide care for. So it begins with one pill, but the end begins with us. And one kid matters. We're not going to save them all. We're not going to prevent, even though technically it's an entirely preventable illness and heroin death is entirely preventable, we have to start with one kid at a time. If everybody here is able to do that one thing, get involved in that one thing that they know is going to make a difference, whether it's on the prevention level in the community or being a prescriber or being a referral source, we're not going to save everybody but one life. One life for everybody who's in this room, that's a huge number of kids. And one, save, what's that saying? It says that you save one life, you save the entire world. There's truth to that. Um, so work with me. Everybody had goal B to save one life today. Thank you.